The first thing to do is to find a model or reference photo for your painting. I like to use Pinterest. There are four things I try to avoid when picking out a reference photo. 1. Information loss. A lot of photos will have areas of the face that are over or underexposed, leaving the area a white or black mass where there's no information about the form being depicted. Here we have some examples of this where the underexposed areas are outlined in red. And here we have some examples of overexposed areas, which is the same thing but there's too much light rather than not enough light. 2. Models that are lit in a way which flattens form. In order to practice portraiture effectively, you should try to use a model that you can see the three-dimensionality of the form. Remember, you're trying to study a portrait, not take a test with a fill-in-the-blank section. 3. Images that are heavily edited. Filters, blur, or vignetting. Most edited images have removed information in some way, and as an artist, it's really important to practice simplifying and removing information in your paintings from how you would see things in real life, not through a filter that already does that for you. 4. Models where a portion of their face or head is cut off. Again, this is technically another form of information loss. If a portion of the head is cut off, then it's much harder to represent it accurately, so you're forced to make things up, which admittedly could be a good form of practice for a halfway point between painting what you see and painting from imagination. However, I would argue that most of the time, you're just hindering yourself by choosing a reference which doesn't include what you want to study in its entirety. Now, what I do look for in a reference is directional lighting, or lighting that I find interesting, and a face or image that makes me go, hey, I could stare at that for three hours straight. Once you've found your reference image, open that puppy up in your digital painting program of choice, and now you have the correct aspect ratio of the photo you're painting. Remove the photo and replace it with a blank layer. I usually fill it in with a light gray. Then I'll open up the reference photo and keep it next to my painting. For Krita, it has a built-in reference layer where you can move the images off into the side of the canvas, but I prefer using pure ref because I like to keep my reference images and painting separate. If the image dimensions of the photo you chose are a little too small, just enlarge the canvas proportionally by multiplying the height and the width by the same amount until you get a canvas size that works for you. Now, before you start drawing, I found it's helpful to figure out exactly what you want to get out of your practice. For instance, I've been practicing refining my workflow, which is just the steps you take to get the finished result, and in training my eye to see and accurately record proportions. But it could be anything from making sure you get the values or colors right, achieving a likeness, or just making a painting that feels a certain feels a certain way, or looks a certain way stylistically. This way you're not just mindlessly copying the reference. Now, once I've done all of that, I start with the sketch of the portrait, and I make sure to sketch on a new layer so that I can paint behind it later, and I start by sketching the basic outline of the model as if I was going to create a silhouette of them. I consider the distance from the outline to the edge of the canvas, and compare with my reference to get a better sense of how accurate my work is. From there, I begin to work on the placement of the features. You can see that I've drawn a circle around the mouth and the chin. This is me basically creating a topographical map of the face, which helps me think of it in three dimensions and gets a more accurate representation of the photo. I also draw in a shape for the eye sockets. I'm thinking about how the brow bone protrudes over the eyes and how the eyes will sit further back from the cheeks, simplifying the nose into a cone shape that has been split in half. This is so I can see if the placement is correct. Since the location of the features seems to be more important than the shape in getting the likeness of someone. From here, I draw the features in a little more detail to get a better sense of whether or not I'm working in the right direction. Since we're working digitally, I take full use of the selection and liquify tool to move and push around features in order to save time, as opposed to completely erasing and redrawing them. After I decide that the sketch looks like the person, I paint in the colors of the background, which helps me later in painting the colors of the model as the environment will inform the colors of the subject to some degree. Once that's done, I try to decide on the local color and value of the model's skin, hair, and clothing. Using this method, I break down the painting into smaller and smaller groups of color, trying to get closer and closer to what I'm seeing in the reference image. I had a particularly hard time with this image because the oranges and yellows are so saturated, which makes the desaturated reds and grays on the right side of her face look much bluer than they actually are. Once I get the shape small enough, I zoom into the canvas and pick a feature to work on in more detail, either one of the eyes, the nose, or the mouth. And I usually take it pretty far, as this helps me figure out the colors for the rest of the face as well. For this portrait in particular, I started with the eye on the left because I wanted to draw more attention to it than the eye in shadow, 
which should naturally have less information since it's not as well lit, although in the end I think I accidentally ended up doing the reverse. When working on the lips and nose, I make sure to include some saturated reds and oranges in order to mimic the subsurface scattering, which is simply when light enters an object and bounces around for a bit, causing the object to glow slightly. At this point, I flip the canvas because I want to catch the parts of the face which stand out as unfinished or out of proportion relative to the rest of the painting. Once I've finally gotten the face to a point that's about finished, I begin working on everything else in the painting. Starting with the nearest objects first, which in this case is her shirt. After that, I created a new layer and drew in the shadows from the fence onto her face, and then began working on the fence. I tried to create a grid in perspective with the intention of drawing the metal wire by hand, but what I ended up doing is drawing one length of the fence in a way that patterns seamlessly, and then I filled the layer with that pattern and used the transform tool to put it into perspective. After that, I used the liquify tool to move parts of the fence around a bit in order to make each link look distinct from each other. After that, I painted over parts of it to lighten the side facing the light and painted in the rest of the background. Then I blur the layer to keep focus on the model and to make her feel more crisply rendered in comparison. Finally, I added one more layer and set it to color dodge mode to make the light side of her face glow a bit more like it is in the photo. And at that point I've called it finished. So anyways, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you want to support me.